For quite some time now, reading Attack on Titan every single month feels like its own enclosed experience, and with everything continuing to push forward towards the conclusion of the story, the stakes and consequences have never been higher. The polarizing experience is many different things, from suffocating, intoxicating, enthralling, devastating, soul crushing and even heartbreaking. You never know what combinations of emotions you're going to get, intertwined so beautifully and effortlessly within its artwork, its character, interaction and their emotions. The twists and turns within the narrative, revealing, acknowledging and concluding different concepts. This month has done all of that and more, with Isayama going above and beyond to lay out more of his cards, which includes hidden ones, more clearly, before we dive deeper into the final moments which are ever so close. The information that is provided through those cards being played not only shapes, contrasts, and emotionally reinforces us for what's to come, it also helps free up Isayama's exposition within more climatic moments, so our focus won't be on understanding the reveal of information within critical situations, but instead on the heartbreaking emotional events unfolding right in front of our eyes. We are all ready to be sat down and tunneled in on how Isayama is going to hurt us by the end, but of course it wouldn't be Attack on Titan without him throwing some curving jabs our way to make us realize that anyone could realistically be killed. But hey, and to prepare yourself as best you can. I absolutely love this chapter. Not only was I interested to see how things would actually progress from last month's events, rest in peace the queen, but the amount of versatility within some of the rather emotional field moments caught me off guard. I had a feeling we would get some plan of attack from the group, but I didn't expect to be punched in the heart when they all go to witness child Aaron and his conviction. That definitely hurt. But I also never thought I'd hear the day where a titan could potentially fly. I was surprised they could float, let alone swim, but flying is a whole different extreme. Like are we about to witness a giant bald eagle, or something along the lines of angel wings? Also just came to the realization with this new information that the person flying will be Falco, I guess because being named after a falcon bird will have its benefits now. On the nose foreshadowing and symbolism, funny enough works inherently well when you don't expect a goliath titan to be soaring through the clouds. That's actually probably more scarier than Eren right now. There is a lot of amazing things within this chapter to propel us into the conclusion of the story, and I'm ever so excited, just like all of you, to see how this masterful experience comes to an end. With the opening out of the way, let's unravel this chapter further and see if anything is hiding underneath. Also, if you end up enjoying this video, consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. So we open up to the entire gang planning on how they're going to take down Eren. And obviously, there's a lot of different options, opinions, and even hypothetical approaches they discuss. It's honestly great to see so many people from different places, perspectives, and understandings slowly coming together in harmony to plan an attack. It's hardly conflicting, more so acknowledging. They all have their own piece of information to add to the mix that plays a vital importance in grasping the full scope of the image. And I remember months, maybe even a year back, when a percentage of people said something like this would never be possible. That Eldians and Malians on the front lines couldn't coexist, let alone work together to take down a bigger threat. This shows how much they have all been forced to grow, how they have all been forced to look outside their own prejudice, their own hatred, and the one instilled onto them, to seek a better future, not one filled with so much hate, one filled with the possibility of co-compatibility and surviving. Obviously this doesn't absolve the sins of everything that has happened, but this opening segment goes a long way in reiterating that no one is perfect, that they have all sinned for what they've believed in, that they can openly acknowledge their own flaws and understand their victim's point of view, they can wholeheartedly reflect and even possibly atone. It's an extremely powerful message, and most likely the last time you may see it so clear and consistent within so many people. The end of the chapter also throws in a more raw and authentic utilization of it, which isn't so much of an understanding, but more the common threat of death and surviving by bringing them together by whatever means. This incredible emotion is the backbone for this opening segment, with Rhino probably being the most hard hitting one. Him finally feeling like he understands. Aaron, even if it's in the slightest, plays a massive role in breaking down how Aaron is currently thinking, as they all collectively agree that he probably feels the immense burden of committing mass genocide and secretly may even want to be stopped. While you can see the options slowly open up, it's not that simple. 
The mindset Aaron is currently within is something that I talked about within chapter 131, where we first see him as a child. That the emotional and mental turmoil that Aaron put himself through to come to this conclusion potentially made him shed his humanity by splitting himself, which would be recognized as two different individuals, child Aaron within the paths and adult Aaron attached to the Titan. This isn't by accident, it's something Aaron may have done to allow himself the freedom of such burden by regressing his mental and emotional state back to a place of ignorance, a mindset where current knowledge is neglected and not accepted. We have seen the burden of Aaron's decisions. We have seen him break and destroy himself trying his hardest to completely shed his care for human life. And back then I expressed it seemed like he couldn't do it. That his current state with everything he has experienced over his life wouldn't allow him to take those final steps into no return. If something like this is the case, the option to get through to Aaron and bring him back is even more probable. Especially when everyone is coming to terms with using Armin's Titan to obliterate Eren's Titan, but more so as a last resort. They want to try and talk to him, and thanks to Reiner's self-realization and understanding of Eren, it leads them down to questioning why they were left alone, why their Titan forms were not stripped or withdrawn. Eren has all this power, yet everyone of importance currently is left untouched. This is when they're all dragged into Ymir's realm, where we see all of them crying out to Eren to stop this, that the damaged cause can be enough to potentially talk out a deal for a handful of years, that they are confident they can figure something out. There's something about this moment that's deeply moving. Everyone is shouting at Eren in pain. Not their own pain, but the pain they feel for him. They want to save Eren from this suffering. They want to share his burden and help him create a future where everyone is free. Honestly, as quick as it flowed through, it's a rather touching moment. Especially Mikasa with how sincere she looks expressing her want for him to return. This is where they finally meet child Eren. And are met with some memorable words that echo through Attack on Titan's narrative. I can't stop the rumbling. I can't gamble paradise's future. I'm going to keep moving forward. I took the world's freedom to achieve my own, but I won't steal yours. You are free. Your freedom to save the world, my freedom to keep moving forward. If neither steps down, we would collide. There's only the option to fight, that there is no need to talk. The only way to stop me is by ending my life. You are free to do so. Side by side, Child Aaron and Ymir Fritz stand, an emotional experience that I don't think anyone will ever forget. The Aaron they are speaking to now is not the one they knew, not the one they hoped for. Instead, a completely shut off individual that will continue pushing forward and has accepted his own death, with Ymir Fritz by his side. It's extremely sad to realize that everything Aaron is saying is something that Ymir never got the chance to do, someone that was forced into this position, someone that was manipulated and controlled by royals. Even in her death, she was desecrated, cannibalized on and shackled to the past, never allowed to be free for as long as the power existed. Eren has freed her, and their mindsets have aligned to work together, one fueled by rage and revenge, and the other filled by the desire to simply be free. It's also not to say that Eren wants to die, but more so he has accepted his own death. He has accepted anything that may come his way, likely the price he had to pay to acquire this type of mindset, shedding the responsibility of living to harness the unstoppable mindset of continuing to move forward. The remainder of this chapter focuses on two different things, a bit more of an emotional connection to Annie, alongside Gabby and Falco providing information so they can hopefully join the battle, as well as a perspective from Marley and soldiers and some parents of the main cast, escaping to the airships where everything is taking place. These moments are rather simple in their delivery, but their focus on emotions and vulnerability feels incredibly authentic and well done. On top of that is Isayama driving home the old altering perspectives, considering these will likely be the last time you see such contrasting before heading into the final confrontation. Throughout the narrative, Isayama has wanted to make you feel conflicted, to jump back and forth on which side you support, on which character you support. At the beginning, everyone would naturally take a side, but the more he has opened up these channels of knowledge, the more these characters have come to understand one another, 
the more your own perception potentially starts to shift. In reality, it could now be as small as going from fully supporting Aaron, destroying the world, to now just wanting to see him survive and be free. Wherever you land is completely up to you. These moments show characters that have taken themselves out of the situation, but are drawn back in and want to help, even children. I love the very subtle conversation that Annie has with Kiyomi, who is eye-opening for her. Seeing Kiyomi's point of view and regrets makes Annie acknowledge her own understanding of things, as well as cherishing the people close to her. This is where Gabby and Falco bring up some rather interesting information. Turns out, Falco got a portion of Zeke's memories and somewhere within that bloodline lay dormant a flying titan that he is connected to. So their goal, after Annie comes to the realisation that it's too late to do anything, is to get Falco to transform and fly towards the final battleground. Like I said before, it sounds extremely weird thinking about a flying titan, but at this point, why not? And even though Annie is hesitant claiming that it's too late, Kiyomi reinforces her and saying that she doesn't care if they transform and break the boat, she just doesn't want to deepen her own regrets, which seems like it's enough to empower Annie to fight and allow Falco and Gabby to bring her to the battlefield. To be honest, I feel we all had a slight inclination that Annie wasn't truly done with the story, and now we get this chapter it somewhat raises a red flag, especially because her old man is on that very train, alongside Gabby and Falco's parents, heading straight towards the final war zone, where funny enough, Eren shows up within the chapter right at the end, as they realise their own escape is actually a bombing run to try and slow him down. All I'm going to say about Annie is that this chapter could easily be seen as a build up to her ending moments, as I can now 100% see her dying within this final fight. As much as I would love to see her survive with her father, something about her dying while potentially protecting him, something that Armin may even witness, would absolutely break everyone. This emotional connection we have to her now is exactly what Isayama done with Hanji, so I would advise that you all mentally prepare yourself for something along those lines, just in case. All in all, this chapter was incredible, and once again, really puts into perspective just how close we are to Attack on Titan's conclusion. I can't help but think about how emotional and enthralling these moments will also be within the anime, alongside some saddening music. We are basically entering the final fight. Everything is set out and ready to be witnessed. So let's experience it together to the end. Please let me know your thoughts, opinions, theories, any ideas you may have about the future, even your emotions. How did this chapter make you feel? What was your favourite moment? Mine was 100% Darren's speech and those final powerful words he said. Just thinking about that makes me sad but I'd love to hear your thoughts. With that said, I want to thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Drink plenty of water and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.